Hello, I'm Danielle Park, and this is Not So Common Sense for the week of October the 12th. As the political standoff in Washington this week moved from bad to embarrassing, last week the world, to little notice, received the 2013 UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, concluding, yet again, that human behaviors are having a damaging impact on the planet. I recall being in Toronto in 2006 when Sir Nicholas Stern presented the findings of his 700-page report commissioned by the British government on the impacts and financial costs of climate change. At that point, the Stern Commission was recommending that immediate steps to reduce carbon emissions were necessary and that the annual expenditures needed amounted to about 2% of the world's then GDP. Even though world GDP was growing at a record clip at that point, Critics said that costs were impossible to absorb. About a year later, the credit bubble burst, and government efforts to clean up the financial crisis of 2008 have since cost the world more than 2% a year of its GDP growth. In the meantime, of course, environmental issues have been knocked to the bottom of the funding pile. All of this brings me to this week's podcast guest. Today I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Bradley Dibble, who's a physician and a cardiologist by day. He's also a declared political conservative, and in 2009 was appointed by the Federal Minister of the Environment to the Sustainable Development Advisory Council, where he invests a good deal of his time learning more about the science and causes of climate change. In 2011, he wrote a book called Comprehending the Climate Crisis, Everything You Need to Know About Global Warming and How to Stop It. And since then, He's been writing and speaking about climate change issues all around the country. He's the father of two young boys and an excellent musician, but that's another story. And Brad Dibble joins me today in our studio in Barrie. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Danielle. You know, I've been wanting to have a conversation with you for well over a year now, Um, ever since I basically heard about your book and got a copy and, and read it. And I must say I was very intrigued because, um, you know, having gone to high school together, I knew that you were a smart math and science guy for sure. Uh, I knew that you'd become a cardiologist. And we talked a few times over the years just at social functions about some of the struggles and challenges of that work. Um, But I also knew that you described yourself as a political conservative. And that, to me, was very fascinating because... In my experience, it's um, almost always the case that uh, the people I have known to be conservative are also staunchly opposed to the idea of humans having an impact on climate change. Many times they'll acknowledge climate change, but they simply say it's, you know, it's happening because of all these other factors or it's a normal cycle and there's nothing really humans can do. But I wanted to know specifically why you think so many people today invest so much energy in this refuting this idea and and insisting that if there's not a hundred percent consensus then it's not something we should think about yeah Yeah, well it's a very good question i think there's probably a, a number of aspects to the answer i think one basic one i would consider is money the fossil fuel industry makes a lot of In fact, if you add up all of the fossil fuels just in the U.S. alone, coal, oil, natural gas, and if it was all burned, that would be $7 trillion for the big companies. The biggest corporation on the planet is ExxonMobil. So when you start to get some science saying this is a problem and this is the cause of the problem, you're going to have a lot of people who are going to start to dig in their heels because they're not going to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Let's shut up our shop and and we'll start to look to renewable sources of energy, even though we're sitting on all of this money, essentially, black oil, you know, black gold. So I think that's a big part of it. Um, and there's a lot, that's not just conspiracy theory. There's a lot of good evidence to support that. It turns out that we've seen this same problem happen many times before when something scientific comes along, say cigarettes cause cancer. And we will see that that might be harmful to the tobacco industry. And so what they will do is they will try to spin doubt. 
there's an excellent book on this whole topic called uh, Merchants of Doubt. Um, and it explains all of this in exhaustive detail as to how they hire people who are scientists, although not scientific experts in the area, who can start to spin doubt. And the problem then is when there's any doubt, people are less inclined to act. So although I think there are some people with malicious intent that are behind a lot of this, I think a lot of the people out there who you say are, are the conservatives who may be opposed to the concept, I don't think they're malicious. I think, unfortunately, the doubt has been spun, and now they're affected by that. And it's a big deal to make a big change away from fossil fuels. It's the backbone of this whole global economy. And so it makes it tough to change without them feeling sure enough that that's the right thing to do. The problem there, when they say that unless there's 100% certainty, is, is science is never 100% certain about anything. And so that misunderstands some scientific concepts. But for example, right now you referred to the IPCC report. They have greater than 95% certainty that global warming is happening and that we are the main culprit. And that is the same type of certainty that exists with cigarettes cause cancer. So to put it in perspective, we do know, but there's a lot of problems with with the fossil fuel industry trying to preserve their profits. And I think that's human nature. So what about the idea that um, you know a, a lot of the large energy companies will tell you that they are actively investing in the development of alternative fuels? I've heard this many times over the last few years. What evidence do you see that that's a bona fides claim? <laughs> Not much. You know, I think the best thing I hear from them is the so-called clean coal. You know, we're working on clean coal. And the, I really don't think that exists because burning coal is a big, is, it's the worst of the three fossil fuels. But uh, there seems to be so much opposition to uh, solar, wind, subsidizing them. They fight tooth and nail to prevent that from happening. Yet meanwhile, they've enjoyed subsidies for decades and decades. And so I don't think they are, if they claim that, they're not really showing the evidence for that. Uh, because especially down south of the border, uh, corporate interests really run the politicians. Again, I know that sounds conspiracy theory, but it's true. They, they fund so much. And so that's why when the politicians are making decisions, they're not really making decisions too often based on what the population that voted them in want. They're making decisions based on what's going to get them funded to help run their next election campaign. And uh, the fossil fuel industry puts really literally many, many, many millions of dollars into this. In fact, billions when you add it all up across the board. So what about, this brings me to the Harper government, the conservative government that's been in power in, in Canada for a number of years now. Um, the lobbying aspect, the controlling interests of the corporations that you mentioned about the US, I actually follow that considerably in the work and the analysis I do on the US. But what about Canada? What What is your, I know you've, done consulting work with the Harper government. Um, what is your assessment and how do you how do you manage to stay part uh, positive working with them given that dynamic you've just described? Uh, well, I guess I stay positive only because I think it would be too hard to <laughs> think the other way about it. In Canada, we're a lot more fortunate than our friends south of the border because Corporate interests don't run politicians the same way as they do down south. That's not to say there can't be influence, but the funding, the whole way that campaigns run is different. So I feel a lot better about our, our politicians up here. But um, Harper and his government have really made the decision that the economy of today is what's most important. And so when they look at uh, oil as a needed substance around the planet, and we're sitting on 13% of the world's bitumen out in the Athabasca tar sands, um, they say we should develop this because now a barrel of oil is, is affordable enough that we can make a lot of money by selling this stuff. And the world wants it. I, I kind of liken that to, uh, I have an analogy where I say it's like oil is the drug, the world is the junkie. And Canada right now is trying to be the best dealer for this stuff. So, but that that's the decision. If that brings money into Canada, that makes a government that tends to think in terms of four-year increments that makes them popular if they've got money and they've got jobs and unemployment goes down 
So I, I refer to this many times. It's it really is the decision of what's most important: the economy of today or the environment of tomorrow. Because you can't have both. You you have to make some financial hits today if you're going to make the environment of tomorrow better. And that's really the whole definition of sustainable development. It's making sure we don't compromise the needs of the future, but also we don't compromise our needs. And that's where some conservative opponents will say, ah, well, you see, you're asking us to sacrifice too much by making these changes. So you're asking us to compromise our needs today, and that's where that problem comes. Well, that's the frustration that I note is that you know, there's a business cycle that runs through our economy. It takes about five years to complete each time. There's about three or four years of expansion typically and then one year of contraction or downturn. And invariably, you know, people will say they can't afford to do anything substantive or you know, invest for the future in the downturn phase, but they also tend to say that in the expansion phase. They also send say things like, well, you know, get out of our way. Basically, we're trying to get the economy going. We can't afford to put money aside now. And, and therefore, nothing really, there's never a good time to put money aside or invest for the future. Something else that's disturbed me as a Canadian over the last few years, I guess it's always perhaps been this way, but as you get towards 50, you start to be more cognizant, I think, is that the international community, I think, has really come to see us as, what, as you described, sort of the, the nicest pusher in the neighborhood. Um, and, and I think I've heard a lot of things like the Copenhagen Summit, et cetera, where we were literally uh, called out as someone who was um, actively you know, resisting the carbon controls and things that were being promoted by the international community. So we're literally um, seen as now, you know, just looking out for our own short-term interests and not a help in the international community. And it seems to me on that issue, that's different than what we Canadians like to see ourselves in the global arena. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I found Copenhagen very frustrating and the fact that we pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol has been frustrating. All of these are bad signs on on the global view, because uh, you're right. I, I think I think of the tar sands as the dirtiest oil on the planet, because you have to create the most emissions per barrel uh, doing that. Now they try to defend the argument by again saying this. You know, it's everybody wants it. Everybody else is doing it. Why shouldn't we? Um, and they also point out that as far as Canada goes, our emissions they say are very small compared to the U.S. and China. But that's only by virtue of the fact that we're a smaller country. Yes, we're in a more northern climate, so as a result, we tend to burn a little bit more fossil fuels to stay warm, and our cities are a little farther apart, so we tend to drive a bit more. But but still, they say that our, our total emissions are a small percentage, that these tar sands will be a small percentage, and so that's the way they kind of justify it to themselves. I think it's a bad argument. I'd like to see us being a leader in some way. I think we've been disappointed with the leadership south of the border, and I think the Americans tend to think they're the only ones who really can lead it. And so until they make a change, I think a lot of other countries like Canada are saying, don't ask us to sacrifice ourselves if you're not prepared to at least do the same. Yeah. So I'm, you know, for example, I'm optimistic, uh, cautiously optimistic that President Obama will say no to Keystone XL as a message that the time has come for the world to start taking this issue seriously. And uh, I know Harper and his government are putting a lot of pressure that it should go forward, but that's a purely economic decision, and it's not, it's not a good one, I don't think, for the long-term health of the planet. Until we start at least seeing us level off, let alone go to these more extreme sources of fossil fuels, offshore drilling. Now they're talking about, hey, it's great, the ice cap at the North Pole is melting enough that we can start drilling up there. And it's like, oh, that's such a wrong mindset to me. I mean, I must say that when uh, Barack Obama came in in the U.S. 2008, the height of the credit crisis, you know, the banks had been revealed as fraudulent. There was so much mayhem and suffering and loss everywhere that I thought it might be an opportunity to take the country in a new direction, to literally tabula and say, you know, we're going to change these fundamental things about the way we're trying to drive the economy. In other words, not just on credit bubbles, but on infrastructure investment and more intelligent energy. And he certainly spoke about all that. But again, I haven't seen very much evidence of that, other than he has so far been reticent to decide the Keystone issue. But the latest indications that I've heard were that that is an imminent 
decision that's going to be coming in favor of it in the not too distant future. So is that not what you've heard? Well, yeah, the, I think one of the things, um, there's another really good book out there called Breakthrough that came out back, I think, around 07. And they talked about uh, how environmentalists have just taken the wrong approach. And one thing, you mentioned that that would have been a great time. And I think on paper, you're right, that would have maybe made sense. But when people have uncertainty about their economic health, even their own finances and their own homes, they're not in a mindset to make any change about anything that might be better for other people for the rest of the planet, for the future generations. So uh, it turns out historically, you, you kind of have to have society get to a point where all of their material needs are met, to the point where they can then start to become comfortable enough to think altruistically so that their post-material needs can start to be met. So when you are asked to sit on, I think you've had two terms, uh, the min federal minister right. of fire, uh, Minister of the Environment has asked you to sit on the Sustainable D Advisory Council. What exactly do they, what, what is your input to the government in that capacity? Well, that's a very good question. In fact, it's one of the things that led me to writing the book because they, um, it's a lot more at this point about process rather than content. Uh, so uh, what they're dealing with is making sure that the right hand knows what the left hand's doing because there's a lot of, uh, crossover between what maybe Ministry of the Environment wants to do, but also other other portfolios that other cabinet mem ministers might have. So the what we get to say is not policy driven, unfortunately. I have better impact when I have conversations with these politicians than with what we do on the council. And so that's why I've actually sought out having having my connections to these cabinet ministers. I've had both uh, Peter Kent and before him Jim Prentice uh, in my home so I can have these conversations and I feel that's that's one thing that this SDAC, the Sustainable Development Advisory Council, has offered me is the connection with these folks. The problem I can tell from my discussions with them is that it's not like what we say uh, as individuals, as Canadians, is going to influence those people to make a change. I, I really get the impression that the buck stops all the way at the top with the current government, and I don't think that that any one cabinet minister has the ability to say, oh, you know what, that we should really do that and change that. Unless our prime minister feels that's the thing to do, There's, I don't think there's any change in the course that he's laid out for us. So have you ever thought of running for office yourself? And if so, do you think that the elected officials have more say or or sway in any of these policy issues than people that are, for example, just advising the elected officials? Uh, well, to answer the first question, no, I will never, ever, ever run for office. Um, I, For too many reasons, but one of the big ones being you have to be stuck with what caucus says, and you really can't sway from that. So, for example, if I was an MP, I would have hated to not come out and say this asbestos issue that we had to deal with in Quebec is wrong. Uh, like I, I would hate to have had to defend that in any way because I know as a physician that was just bad and we should have changed it long ago. So um, I have a hard time towing the party line and yet if you're an independent and you don't have a caucus to support you then you're kind of a lone fish and you won't have much sway either. So I would much rather interact with the politicians and the political committees because I think that's where I see evidence that we have a better impact. Uh, for example, unrelated to global warming, but earlier this year I spoke to the Parliamentary Committee on Health. And you can tell when they ask you questions that this is a report they're going to make and it may actually have an impact on what the Minister of Health then goes and does with it. So I think that's where we have our, our, our uh, in influence. And so I'd much rather be kind of a behind-the-scenes person talking to these people and trying to sway them. Because once you're a politician, your hands are tied. Carbon pollution is, is bad on many ways, not just because the emissions cause global warming, but just the particulate matter in the air. Uh, I was in Beijing in 2009, and I've never been in a place that where the pollution was so awful. Uh, to, see, uh, to see no blue sky for days and days at a time because of that smog, and they have... And so, for example, as a cardiologist, um, we know that our patients who have heart and lung issues are very affected by pollution. And so we can anticipate that's going to be worse. 
There's more than just the particulate matter, the soot in the air too though. There's, uh, for example, ground level ozone or what's called tropospheric ozone. Ozone's good up high, it helps shield ultraviolet light in the stratosphere, but down here it's bad. And in fact, it's uh, considered to be the cause of 5% of all cardiopulmonary deaths in Canada. And that's only going to increase as well. And warming uh, leads to a lot of other health issues for the, you know, the, the frailest in our society. So the very young, the very old, and the sick are all going to suffer when there's more heat, more droughts. We're going to have problems with food shortages. We're going to have trouble accessing free, um, fresh water. And uh, even funny things like, like a friend of mine in town is an allergist. And he says already within one generation, they've been able to document that the ragweed season, for example, is longer. It starts earlier. It lasts longer. And so there's, in very short time spans, we're seeing real changes to the health of people around the world. And we can predict that's only going to get worse. So it's that, it's that dual impact of um, diminishing the quality of the air around us, but it's also diminishing our need to exert ourselves physically, which is a huge part, I'm sure, of the work that, that you see or the patients that you see are probably not the most physically active. Well, yeah, for the, the obesity epidemic worldwide and therefore type 2 diabetes at younger ages. We used to call type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes, and yet now it's starting so often in adolescence, we can't even call it that anymore. So you're right, we've made this world of our, for ourselves that has a lot of convenience mechanically, so you don't even have to go to the grocery store. You can order your groceries online. But we've got all these machines build, burning all this energy to make our lives better, and yet they're really not better in a lot of ways for health. Um, we're less fit. We're, we're, this is probably the first generation that is not going to live as long as its parents did um, because we've kind of hit a plateau and are coming around the other corner. But I think it's important to say, like what we're talking about here, I certainly don't advocate moving to some kind of a Luddite existence. You know, our, our species is meant to continue to advance and move forward. So the thing here is we have to continue to advance and move forward, but in a way that's healthier for us. So I don't suggest we stop doing all that stuff, but I, st I suggest we start putting research and development into other sources of energy we can use, like wind, like solar, like tidal, like geothermal, and we can get off the fossil fuels and yet continue to enjoy all the things that our species wants, our you know first world living standard. And one of the people that both of uh, both you and I we spoke of before that inspires me in that area is Elon Musk with Tesla because he, you know, has done basically what all the naysayers said was completely impossible and he has started a little car company that could and is now producing, you know, one of the finest automobiles in the world that's entirely green and emission free and it's won all the awards not just for green cars but for cars in general. Um, what would you say though um, to the people who write me all the time when I put clips of uh, Elon Musk on and say, you know, get your head out of the clouds, uh, creating green products and green cars is the most carbon intensive activity a human could do and you know you're just creating waste and pollution in other ways to make yourself feel better by having these. There's a, a, no matter what you turn to as an alternate source of energy, you're going to find detractors who are going to criticize it. So if it's solar, they talk about the rare elements that need to be used or the fact that it's being built in China and they're making the most emissions. Whether it's wind that supposedly contributes to something called wind turbine syndrome uh, or whether it's electric cars where they talk about the batteries and how are we going to deal with those. There's always a detractor, and I think it, there's usually at least some degree of legitimacy to some of these concerns. So the issue is, I don't think it's realistic for us to wait until we find something perfect, because there'll never be anything perfect. But I would much rather still go and deal with those concerns that these alternatives have compared to the concerns that go with fossil fuels. And another point about this that I think is important to appreciate is, yes, if, we, if, if you look to something like an electric vehicle that's been built, and it used um, fossil fuels to energize that process, that's because that's our infrastructure on the planet. And if you say, until you have green energy, you can't do that, well, then that'll never happen. So right now in this transition, we're going to have to burn fossil fuels to get us to the step where manufacturing will be completely green electricity. So I don't buy that argument either, because then that really is just an argument to say, let's just carry on forever and 
see what happens to the planet as we destroy it. So I, I like that about your book, actually. Chapter six, you go into a bunch of stuff that individuals can do. You know, again, as you say, we're not advocating anybody go back to the Stone Ages. Um, we're simply saying that after more than 100 years with a combustion engine, I think it's time for civilization to use some of this really smart science that we've developed. And that, you know, again, the, nair the naysayers typically say, well, you can't replace fossil fuels with solar or you can't replace it with geothermal. My point has always been that it makes sense to me to use everything that there's available. And whether that's uh, momentum energy generated from me walking, you know, to work in the morning, to power my own watch or to power my own iPhone. Uh, certainly if we could just chip away at all those obvious ones, you know, solar clearly makes sense in many applications, we could no doubt diminish the ones that we need fossil fuel for at this point. So what, what do you think, um, I, again, I find a very conservative or, or far right take is typically that the government has no right, you know, incenting human behavior in certain directions or offering subsidies to people trying to develop alternative energies and technologies. And they will say that that's, you know, socialism and we shouldn't get involved with that. What, what do you think government or policy, what role should that play in this evolution? I think it's huge. Um, so I suppose I'm a more moderate conservative than perhaps a lot of people who are members of the conservative party would be. But I think that I feel a one role of government is to help look after the people who live in that country. That's why government mandates certain rules like, you know what, you got to wear seatbelts. Why, why do we have to wear seatbelts if the only person who's going to be killed in that car accident is us? Well, that's because they've mandated it that, you know what, you're a valuable enough human being, we're going to make this a rule so that you are as safe as possible. And, and so I think one of the things where governments need to start moving towards this is because they need to help take care of the people in their country and around the world. We give foreign aid to all sorts of people that we don't know. And in this situation, I think it's we have to really help look after the future generations that we don't know. But to imply that the free market can take care of this, market forces, it just history has shown us no, that doesn't work because market forces tend to look to the next quarter, not the next century. And that's how we have to think if we're going to solve this problem. And, and you were pointing out, you're right, it, it's definitely a multi-pronged solution that we have to look to every possible source of renewables and we have to look to improved efficiencies and uh, things like that. But I also think it's short-sighted whenever anybody says solar will never replace or wind will never replace. Because you know what? Once upon a time, somebody said planes will never be good for anything. Nobody will have computers in their homes. And that's because they can't think outside the box enough. But when you realize how much energy there is with solar and with wind and with the research and development that can go into batteries so that they can store these intermittent sources of energy better so that we've got it available. I have no doubt that we can do it. I mean, we've, you know, I know it's a hackneyed phrase, but we've put men on the moon over 40 years ago. We can definitely find ways to use these sources of energy properly if we would actually just start working on that instead of fighting that process. Yeah, and I think uh, the, the thing in human behavior that I've noticed is that it sometimes people are afraid, I think. You know, at some point there's a tipping point and all of a sudden what, you know, smoking's an example, seatbelts is another example, just things, child labor is another example. I mean, there's many, many things that our society thought were immutable and permanent and yet at some point the optimists finally tip the ball and the pessimists end up saying, Oh, well, obviously, obviously, <laughs> <Yeah>. that <laughs> this makes sense. So I think, you know, some wise person, I forget who once said that if you're not really, if you're not annoying and upsetting the status quo, you're not really leading the future. So uh, I thank you for your book, Brad. I think it's very useful to people. I'll put a, lo a link on the blog and for your speaking and for your optimism and for your insistence that as a man of science, there is... Uh, there are things that people can do, and and uh, it's not a it's not a doom and gloom topic. It's actually exciting, and it, it's probably where most of the growth for our economy is waiting for us oh, for the absolutely. future. Absolutely, jobs and money exist in developing the future that we're going to have in this planet. So, uh, anybody who thinks it's going to be too costly is just not looking at it the right way. This is Danielle Park signing off, and wishing you the very best of health and wealth.